Most of the code that's running in a project is not code that you've written. It's somebody else's code that you're making use of. And so it's really important to be able to make sense of components that you're using because they really are part of your project. Okay, Eric, and how much is this going to cost me? It's free for all public repositories. Hi, developers. Welcome to GitHub Checkout, your inside look at the latest GitHub features and updates that level up your workflow. I'm Andrea Griffiths, Senior Developer Advocate. And today, we're diving deep into dependency auto submission, a powerful feature that's transforming how teams understand and secure their software supply chains. So I'm so excited to learn more about security and the dependency graph specifically. Can you explain to all of us what is the dependency graph? Every modern software project relies on other projects, right? You can't build anything that's uh, more than just a Hello World application without pulling in some kind of open source dependencies. And some of these package ecosystems, everything from NPM to Java to Python, has an amazing ecosystem of projects that are out there that anybody can use and contribute to that help you focus on the, what's most important for your project. But the problem is that the more dependencies that you use from other projects, the more complicated your own project becomes. And managing this tangle of dependencies means that Although you may only require six packages, say, to build your own project, each one of those packages has its own set of dependencies that it has and so forth and so on. And so GitHub has a way of allowing you to see and explore all of those dependencies. It's called dependency graph. Each of the nodes in the graph is a package and each of the edges that connect those nodes is one of those chains of dependencies. It's the platform that powers dependabot alerts so that, for instance, when one of those dependencies of a dependency dependency has a security vulnerability that gets reported, we can notify everybody that is a downstream user of that package that they should upgrade as soon as possible. The dependency graph is available for all repositories on GitHub. One of the new features that we've released since the beginning of 2025 is you'll see these labels on each line of these dependencies that say transitive or they say direct. And this is an indicator that they are either something that has been mentioned directly in your package manifest, or there's something that's mm -hmm. been pulled in by one of your dependencies. And as I said before, you can see the ratio of direct to transitive dependencies. If I look at the direct ones for this project, there's only 21. If I look at the indirect dependencies, the full tree, there's a thousand of them. So that's pretty, that's pretty typical. For the transitive ones too, uh, you can see how that transitive dependency got pulled in. So um, you can tell when there's a problem. This one happens to be log4j, which as you may recall had some security problems a while back, but you can see how that got pulled into your project and therefore what you need to do in your own manifest in order to update it and get to the latest version. So if I'm a developer and I have my project and now I, now I can actually get the full picture with dependency graph, I can see both my direct and transitive dependencies and I can see the level of impact. Like, why should I care about this? Most of the code in a project is, is somebody else's code that you're making use of. And while I, as a developer, may be a, a brilliant and perfect developer who never writes any bugs, in my code, I can't necessarily say the same thing for every developer on every open source project that I may make use of. This all falls into the category of what we call the supply chain or software supply chain. And while overall, this is a massive force for good in the world, I mean, we wouldn't, n none of us would be where we are today without the availability of open source software. Here, here. It, it also presents a significant risk, particularly if you're writing code for a business or you're writing code that has some kind of access to uh, secure credentials, has access to people's personally identifiable information, Th that supply chain is uh, long, it's big, and, it, and it's pretty fragile. And so it's really important to be able to make sense of the components that you're using because they really are part of your project. There's a lot of different package ecosystems out there, as many as there are programming languages and even more because some programming languages have multiple different package managers that you could use. And there's different levels of support that we have for them. One thing I would point out here is that sometimes we can, just by looking at the files that are in the repository, we can build a full transitive tree. NPM is really good for that because the package.lock file shows everything that goes into your NPM package plus the version numbers that they're at. Other kinds of package managers require more 
introspection on how the how the software is put together in order to build that dependency tree. And for those, we have two options. Some of them, we have this uh, auto submission. So you can see for the Java ecosystems, Gradle and Maven, and we're adding .NET support for this in the, in the next week or so. As soon as that's turned on for a repository, GitHub will run an action under the covers, kind of behind the scenes and download all of the dependencies and build the tree and then submit it to our API for you. Even if there's not automatic dependency submission for them, there's a whole bunch of community maintained actions that you can run as part of your build step in GitHub Actions that will do the same thing, sort of generate a software bill of materials or an SBOM and upload that to GitHub's dependency submission API. If you use those actions, you'll still see those dependencies show up in the dependency graph. And if there's dependabot alerting support for them, they'll also generate uh, dependabot alerts. Then this is a publicly documented API. There are other cool open source tools. Sift is a great one that can generate an SBOM on pretty much any kind of programming language you might have. Now I'm inside of one of the dependabot alerts. The dependabot alerts also have information about transitive versus direct relationships. So you can see and prioritize vulnerabilities that are directly mentioned in your own package manifest or in your repository, instead of ones that might be three or four nested levels deep. And you can see that here for this problem. There is an alert and it's pulled in. This, this package is the one that has the problem. But I would know if I'm trying to fix this, that I would probably prioritize getting into this and, and figuring out what's going on with this one and trying to update it less than ones that I would have that are in my direct dependencies. Because here I have to sort of wait for one of the maintainers of this intermediate dependency to update their own tree. Whereas again, if I go in here and filter these down to just the ones that are have a direct relationship to my package manifest, there's only five out, out of that whole giant list that are ones that I actually need to fix in my own code. And it just really helps to prioritize what's important instead of having to wait for some external project to update their own code and update their dependencies. So how can I make sure that I'm using this in my progress? Is there something that I need to turn on? Everything is consistent and you have to go in and specifically enable it if you want dependency graph to be enabled. But it's right here underneath the advanced security part of your settings for a repository. You can also, if you're in an organization or in an enterprise, like GitHub Enterprise, enforce the uh, enablement of dependency graph across your whole organization. If you enable Dependabot, it will automatically also enable the dependency graph. Dependabot does not work without dependency graph, but the inverse is not true. You could turn on dependency graph just to see what uh, your supply chain looks like without necessarily enabling Dependabot alerts about it. But Obviously, we would definitely recommend turning on both things. And beyond information, which information is power, it's great to know what's going on with your dependencies, but also you have actionable data. And Dependabot can create this pull request and actually help you remediate a lot of these concerns. So yes, please turn both of them on. Okay, Eric, and how much is this going to cost me? It's, it's free for all public repositories. I love that. So it's not even just about my hacky projects. It's about keeping the supply chain secure for everybody. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. And that was your comprehensive look at the way dependency graph and dependency auto submission work and how it's transforming supply chain security. Drop a comment below with how this might impact your development workflow. And what ecosystems are you hoping to see are being supported next? And please, if this was helpful, hit that like button and subscribe to this channel for more feature updates and dev tips. Push these changes to main and we'll catch you in the next release.